Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, and also, hi to everyone online. Uh, welcome to the first lecture of the Euro Arab Conversation Lecture Series. Um, the goal of this lecture series is to promote the Euro Arab dialogue and to create a forum to enhance understanding, empathy, and appreciation among the both uh, parties and also in the master community. Um, Lecture series hosts four experts in, uh, in this field from different backgrounds who will share their insight on their political, uh, cultural, intellectual, and economic ties between the two regions. And there will be two lectures in April and also one in May. And the experts for tonight's lecture is Dr. Asim Dandashli, uh, who is an assistant professor here at FASOS at the political science department. His research in, uh, interests include, but are not limited to, <laughs> European politics, European neighborhood policy, democracy, Islam and democracy, and democracy promotion. Uh, in 2021, he wrote an insightful paper on the EU and the LGBTI activism in the Middle East and North Africa, specifically the case of Lebanon. Uh, throughout this lecture, he will touch briefly upon it, and he, as well as the issue of democracy and the LGBTI plus situation in some countries in the MENA region and the role of the international community or the EU. Uh, the lecture will be followed by a Q&A, so you can also ask your questions if you need to. And also for the people online, you can use the Q&A option uh, on Zoom. And now I will leave you with Dr. Dandashli. Thank you. Thanks, Shara. I think I have yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, when I was asked to talk about, to participate in the EU Arab dialogue, I was like, okay, what should I talk about? And then like Shara suggested, maybe you talk about what you're writing on and then uh, democracy or LGBT. And I said, okay, fine. Uh, and then this is also the question that I always receive. Like when I, when people hear that you're working on LGBT uh, IQ plus in the, uh, in the Arab world, Hmm. Are you gay? Like, should I be gay to write on these issues? And then the other, uh, the other thing is, ah, do you support gay rights? Like, if you're writing something objectively, doesn't mean you are pro or anti. Because at the end of the day, you're there. There is a significant part of the societies in the Arab world that belong to certain groups whether you consider them to be minority groups or so. They are bounded within the uh, borders of human rights, the basic principles of human rights, regardless if they are uh, L LGBT, IQ, they are, come from different ethnic backgrounds, etc. If we respect human rights, then they fall under that. And then, mm, but do you think this is really a salient issue? This is what they tell you. Like we don't even have food on the table, we don't have jobs, we don't have this and this and that. And I'm like, oh my God, like you close a door and they open another door. Anyways, uh, today I will talk about the uh, LGBT uh, IQ plus in the MENA region. And we'll talk a little bit about the role of social media in that, uh, in that uh, debate and discussion. Uh, the progress of LGBT in the region uh, and also the role of the EU, if there is any role for the EU in that uh, area, and then finally conclude. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. And bef before starting, uh, as I said, one of the basic characteristics of human rights is being able to express your opinion freely and without any uh, fear that you will be executed or you will be thrown into jail or you have to run to another country for, uh, and live in exile for the rest of your life. That's the basic principle of human rights. And this is one of the core principles of democracy. When the Arab uprising happened in 2011, this way was considered sort of a window of opportunity that maybe things will change to the better. Now, fortunately, this was the case for a very short period uh, in which it was uh, a window of opportunity for queer groups, for uh, LGBT groups, uh, minority groups to participate in the protests in some countries. 
of course, like they, some of them didn't participate as LGBT community uh, organizations, but within the, uh, for example, uh, uh, gender uh, CSO, civil society organizations, or minority groups, etc., under like the human rights aspect, but they were able to have their message conveyed. Uh, however, this window of opportunity doesn't didn't stay open that long because we've seen what happened in uh, Egypt soon after uh, the Muslim Brotherhood took over and then uh, a Sisi regime took over. Uh, in Libya, it, it's still uh, not stable. Uh, Syria ended up uh, in war, etc. So what was considered to be a window of opportunity for democracy ended up a nightmare. And the only beacon that we were hoping in Europe that this will be, and also in the West, that this will be the sort of the role model for democracy in the Middle East and North Africa. Unfortunately, Tunisia is also backsliding with the current uh, president who was elected uh, around two years ago. Uh, things deteriorated significantly in terms of the human rights, in terms of democracy, in terms of freedoms. Uh, so the situation is not really uh, as nice as, as we would like it to see. I like to see it. Unfortunately, it's very uh, gloomy when it comes to democracy, generally speaking. However, is it, that, is it as bad as we can see it from outside? Now, a lot of the literature that talks about democracy promotion and democratization say that they, when it comes to EU democracy promotion or the Western democratization, it ended up in the best scenario with limited success. This is the best scenario. And it, it goes all the way to total failure. And if we look at the MENA re regimes, uh, aside from Tunisia for just three, a, a year ago, all the rest of the Arab world are not considered to be free and are, are either hybrid regimes or non-democracies or authoritarian regimes. But why is this the case? Now, why the EU has been trying to promote democracy for such a long time and the effect or the results have been so limited? And this is a question that is heavily re uh, researched in the uh, scholarship and has been discussed significantly. But we, before delving into this area, it's good to know what is democracy? What is democracy? When you hear the word democracy, what, do you, what, the, what comes to mind? For you, what is democracy? People, yes? Freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, yes? Electoral process. Anything else? What makes your countries democratic? So the ability to speak up about anything without the fear of being arrested, without fearing that if I have different opinion than you or than the, the people in, the, in the, uh, the elites, I won't be thrown into jail or executed or even kicked out of my country. So this is one of the core principles of democracy. However, when we ask people on the other side, what is democracy for you? In a lot of the answers that you receive on democracy, it's the structural facts about democracy, structural basis, free and fair elections. But when it comes to the liberal values, this is a totally different story. And when we ask the people in the Arab world, what does democracy mean to you? A lot of them answer that it is anti-corruption, having good governance, uh, having free fair elections, having jobs, having uh, economic stability, development, etc. So you could see also that the understanding of democracy by the public sometimes is different than what we in the West understand as democracy. And the same thing when we are looking at LGBT uh, IQ plus communities, here we have many acronyms, lesbians, gay, queer groups, etc. But in many places in, in the, uh, when you ask people like uh, a 
about any of these acronyms, many of them don't know. They are all grouped in one under one word, which is gay. So when you tell them like it's just one category, oh, are there more categories? People don't know that. But anyway, so uh, when we look at what the people in the MENA demand and what we in the West are pushing for in terms of democracy, in terms of human rights, we see different understanding about these key concepts. But that shouldn't deprive minorities in the MENA to have free, uh, to be free to say whatever, to speak their voice, to say things that they want to say without fearing on their lives. Now, uh, as the talk is about LGBT, restrictions on these groups is even more. So uh, in, the, in the Middle East and North Africa, there are restrictions on the human rights aspect. And there are restrictions on the freedom of, us, uh, of uh, expression, freedom of associations, you name it. But when it comes to the LGBT communities, it's even stricter. And uh, many of these organizations are not allowed to be registered because laws in those countries prohibit LGBT communities from registering their organizations. You name it, from uh, Algeria to Egypt, Libya, Bahrain, Emirates, it's virtually it's impossible to register such an organization. Even in countries that are more pro-Western, it's hard if it is not even impossible. And most of the time you end up having LGBT community uh, civil society groups creating sort of a human rights organization and then they work under that portfolio. Because if you is if you say I want to register a, a, a lesbian uh, organization or a gay association or queer association, then you face a lot of restrictions and a lot of problems. And you end up basically, uh, one incident I think in, happened in uh, one of the uh, Maghreb countries that when they tried to register an organization, they were kicked out of the, uh, from, the from the official uh, department where they have to register it. In the Ministry of Interior. So uh, things, things are not that easy, even in countries that are considered by the EU as uh, close to us. Uh, for example, if we look at Morocco and Jordan, uh, we have uh, advanced status with those countries. But when it comes to human rights, uh, democracy, uh, freedoms, this is a totally different story. So on what basis we gave them advanced status and privileged partnerships when they don't even respect the basic principles of human rights. Uh, also, one, another thing is the struggle that LGBT communities uh, face from the Mashrik to the Maghreb is unimaginable. In many, in all these countries, LGBT communities are either, uh, or if you're, uh, if you're a gay or lesbian or belong to this group, it's either you are, uh, there are laws that prohibit these activities and in different uh, panel codes are applied in different countries. So it's either vaguely used or specifically, or even you can end up Basically, uh, you can face a death penalty in some countries. For example, if we look at the, uh, uh, the uh, for example, laws in the, uh, that prohibits and criminalize same-sex acts explicitly, Algeria, Morocco, Oman, Tunisia, Syria, and Yemen. Vaguely, Lebanon and Syria, sorry. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, homosexuality is basically you face a death penalty. Now, even in those countries that have vague terms, so for example, that some of them say like unnat unnatural act or act that goes against the norm. What is the norm? How you define it? We're dating, we're using a panel code that dates to the colonization period from the French time and we still apply it till now, in most of those countries that were under the uh, French colonization uh, time. So there were former French colonies. 
Now, uh, even, uh, for example, uh, even when you are, you raise a rainbow flag, and this is what happened with one of the uh, activists, queer feminists from Egypt, Sara Hijazi, uh, she raised a rainbow flag in a concert in Cairo, in Egypt. And we think social media is also a good thing to be used, but at the same time, it's a double-edged sword. So the social media reported this, in this act. And what happened later on, the Egyptian authorities, so she just raised the flag in Cairo. The Egyptian authorities arrested Hijazi. And then, uh, the, the, uh, her, her, basically her crime is that she belongs to a banned group aimed at interfering with the constitution. It's even like a, a sort of a crime. It's a treason, basically. It goes against the constitution. Uh, they, so Egyptian authorities use social media and digital evidence to track down, arrest, and pro prosecute LGBT people. Uh, even people who had been detained stated that the police, when they can't find anything on your phone that connects you to LGBT groups, or that there is any applications related to LGBT, they download applications on your phone to convict you. So it, 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 it is really uh, scary. When you fear, even if you want, the, like before the social media and the creation of Facebook, Twitter, Insta, etc., people from the LGBT communities or the minority groups were living sort of in a prison. With the social media, and you're able to express yourself, you fear also on yourself that you might be hunted and you might be thrown into jail. And if not, you end up basically escaping or uh, living in exile. This is the situation that we face in the uh, MENA countries. And uh, doing interviews on uh, the uh, LGBT communities in the uh, Middle East and North Africa, you learn a lot. And they learned a lot how to basically go, up, go around the system. So the situation, despite the uh, crackdown on uh, LGBT communities, LGBT uh, groups, there is some progress. So it's not that it's al always like gloomy. And we see some uh, progress, for example, if we look at the case of Lebanon, uh, Article 534, and this is the article that is used to basically uh, convict uh, LGBT groups. Article, the penal code, uh, Article 534, criminalize sexual acts which contradicts the laws of nature. That's what the code says. So any sexual act that contradicts the laws of nature is prohibited. And you can end up in jail for, uh, I think, uh, a year or so, and then you have to pay also a penalty. But uh, the article itself, despite the attempts by the former minister of uh, uh, the just, uh, justice, and despite the attempts to change this penal code or abolish it, they failed. But does this mean that the situation is really bad? Not to that extent. Why? In many instances, cases that went to the courts, the courts, the judges decided that they will not apply this uh, law. And they said this goes against the international human rights, laws of human rights. So in many instances, courts have rejected this penal code and didn't apply it. Another thing that we notice also in the MENA countries or in, in the case of Lebanon is that uh, the, uh, before it used to be that if you belong to LGBT, you're basically, uh, you, you're, uh, you're uh, like sick. And you have like uh, the psychiatrist community decided a couple of years ago that this is not a disease. And this was something that uh, progressive in that part of the world. Another thing that one notices when going, when doing, when doing, uh, when watching the TV or so, is that 
also the talk shows uh, has changed. And they have changed in a way that before it was sort of impossible to see uh, LGBT groups exposing themselves on the TV, but this is not the case anymore. Also on the streets, you see some changes. All this shows that there has been some progress in terms of LGBT rights in, for example, in Lebanon. In the case of Morocco, it's still more problematic, but there's also some progress. So uh, you, you see it like it, it goes like in the roller coasters up and down. Sometimes like in the case of uh, Beni Melal, like uh, uh, they were arrested because of homosexual activities. But at the same time, for example, Morocco accepted the three universal periodic review recommendations related to sexual orientation and gender identity. And then also a queer group, uh, non feminist uh, for, formally registered. So you could see it, it goes up and down. I will talk a little bit uh, after like uh, showing the few cases, why, why this is the case and uh, what is really uh, preventing uh, moving forward when it comes to uh, LGBT or women's uh, rights or gender equality or all these uh, issues. In the case of Tunisia, the same story. It goes up and down. One was expecting that after 2011, the situation would be really great. But when one of the candidates uh, for presidential elections in 2019 openly stated that uh, he's gay, uh, he ended up uh, in France. So now he writes from France about supporting uh, gay rights. Uh, however, his act, as he as he say, is to was well, he knew that the society or the people will not accept this easily, but to raise awareness that there is part of the society who belong to these groups, and they should be heard. And now he writes from uh, France. Uh, one one thing that uh, we could see that there has been some changes, for example, in. Uh, the uh, International Gays, uh, Day Against Homophobia was publicly marked for the first time after the revolution. Uh, the film festival launched in Tunis in 2018. Uh, so you see some changes. It's not massive, but there are incremental changes. In the case of uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan established one of the first uh, journals about uh, LGBT groups, and it was in English. However, when it moved to Arabic language, it was banned. But technology is really interesting because after they banned it, and there have been a lot of uh, protests in the parliament and also by people against this uh, newspaper or against this journal, and they blocked the, uh, the website where, like, where it posts its, uh, its, uh, the information, they moved to another server. And if all the uh, news, all the information is also uh, under that server and is available. So also like you could see that sometimes the government turned a blind eye, but they, like we restricted them, but they moved to somewhere else. So it's not really our, our problem anymore. Uh, but still, it's very problematic. It's, it's not easy to be uh, gay or lesbian or queer or, or to belong in the, to this group in this, in this part of the world. Why this is the case? Now, we have to understand something. Keep in mind, most of these countries rely on the penal code of their former colonizers. So if it took ages for the Western democracies to accept LGBT rights, why should we expect it to move really fast? When we have in Europe have issues with the rule of law, with minority rights in some countries within the European Union, why should we expect the situation to be better there? Where the level of religiosity is really high. The role of the religious elites who act as gatekeepers is very strong. Even if the, you have dictators ruling in the countries, but religious elites have a strong say. And the fight for LGBT people is not only against the authorities, but also within their families, because sometimes the family, and many times the families do not accept this because it's culturally, uh, traditions, culture, religion do not permit this to be accepted. Some families are more 
uh, progressive than others, but generally speaking, you're facing, if you belong to, to the LGBT groups, you're facing discrimination from the family, or you have to hide your identity. Otherwise, like everyone would pick on you. At the schools, things are changed, but very slowly, you face also discrimination from others, uh, from your peers and bullying. And then again, when you, as you grow, you grow in such a hostile environment. And this doesn't help in being, uh, in contributing to the society and basically being accepted in this society. And that's why a lot of people leave for a safe haven. And this is the situation that, uh, that people face in that part of the world. And keep in mind, I gave you some examples of countries that are more lenient, if you want to put it that way. Because if you are caught as, a, uh, as belonging or in a homosexual act in Saudi Arabia or in some countries, good, say goodbye to your life. Like, unfortunately. Uh, so, so, so the situation is not uh, as good as we see it here. It's, it, we cannot put all the Arab world in one, uh, as one because the countries have differences. But the general trend in most of these countries is that you cannot be outspoken about your gender orientation or your sexual orientation, sorry. Uh, this is something that is changing, but very, very slowly. Uh, and the gatekeepers, the uh, veto points in those countries are many that do not allow for moving forward. Now, uh, a question that comes to mind is, what can the EU do in all of this? Facing this environment, uh, facing this uh, sort of block or V2 players, what could the EU do? What do you think? Or has the EU done anything to deal with LGBT rights and the MENA? Mm -hmm. So funding to, un, uh, to basically unofficial organizations. What else? Even, for example, when the EU leaders talk about uh, LGBT with the Arab leaders, they tell them, like, we don't have any problem with that. And unfortunately, in, one, in some of the interviews, what I heard from the interviewees is that the EU leaders seem to be okay with that answer. <laughs> but so there is a lot of uh, criticism of the role of the EU. Yeah, but there's a lot like there's more like because we always when you look at democracy promotion, we think at okay, the EU has to push for democracy has to do this and this and that and that and, and, and everywhere in the neighborhood. But the case is not really as such. Democracy promotion has different instruments and dialogue and any uh, attempt for promoting democracy from abroad hasn't been that successful. Let us face it. When we try to promote democracy anywhere, it doesn't work because it has to come from the people themselves. It has to come from the inside. We cannot go and just, okay, we don't like this regime. We, change, we take the leaders and then put another regime. We see this in Iraq, for example. What did we accomplish in Iraq? Unstability, lack of security, problems yeah but we have elections yeah good we have elections but we have a, an unstable regime which had also like was the whole what's the birthplace for isis look at afghanistan after like decades of war but like we we went to afghanistan to change the, the taliban and install democracy and then we end up we leave and we give taliban back to in afghanistan 
uh, this doesn't work. And history shows that. If we want to change a regime, what we can do is it has to come from the inside. It has to come from the people. And we have to support the people who are calling for democracy. And we can support the cause of those people. But if we try to impose things on them, this is not going to work. And that's why when we look at the, what the EU has been doing, as you said, it's mostly funding. And funding through member states, through embassies, through the European Commission, through the delegation. And there are many schemes in which like uh, uh, LGBT communities apply for these, uh, for these uh, funds. Uh, uh, through the European Endowment for Democracy, Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights. One thing is also there's a learning process that takes place. Before, and based on interviews uh, from, with different, uh, different activists, they tell you, yeah, we were competing against each other to get this funding. No, no, they collaborate. So you see more collaboration on the ground among the uh, civil society groups. Uh, another thing is uh, that the EU does is capacity building uh, through the delegation, um, uh, embassies, uh, other civil society organizations. And here, like you have a lot of uh, sort of uh, sh sharing best practices. What can we do? And there are also like uh, advisors that they take place, training sessions, how to be, how to be uh, involved in the society without, uh, without basically being arrested or so how can we do it in a smart way? Uh, there are also lectures, workshops to educate uh, people about uh, this, these issues. Another thing is dialogue with governments and uh, through the embassy, through the delegation, they enter into dialogues with the governments of those countries. But as I said, this, is, this, is, this doesn't really work well because uh, in one of the interviews with one of the main activists in Lebanon, he said, yeah, like they go to the, uh, to the prime minister or to the president and they talk to them and they, yeah, you are cracking down on uh, LGBT uh, people. So you need to uh, take it easy on them. Yeah, but we don't do that. We're not that, like, look at the courts. They are not applying this. Yeah, but the, court, the judges are basically be acting on their own. It's not that the government, if, if it was for the government, the government is throwing people into jail. And they, they, when they go to the uh, court system, some judges, are basically saying this penal code doesn't exist or goes against what Lebanon or what those countries adhere to in res with respect to international uh, codes on human rights and freedoms. Another thing which is really important, and this is something that has been supported by the European delegations and by the member states is the dialogue and the coordination among CSOs. And also there are some more established uh, and uh, internationally human rights uh, activists and CSOs who help these smaller uh, civil society groups to coordinate among each other, to promote more dialogue so that at least they are not fighting for, for the same uh, share or for the same uh, money. Also, there are a lot of round tables, uh, talks, uh, coordination uh, to avoid multiple diverse actions on the same issue. Uh, another thing that we see is that there's more south, like uh, coordination among civil society groups across the region. So from Tunisia to Morocco, to Lebanon, to Jordan, in which they collaborate and coordinate. And this south, south, south dialogue is really important and it does help. And we see, as I said, it's not as gloomy as it, it, it of course, if we look at it from a Western perspective, like if we're living in the Netherlands and we look at the situation there, it's a nightmare. But if we look at the situation 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and now, we see major changes in the society, also in the people view of LGBT communities. And that's basically because of the people on the ground. And of course, there have been support from international community, uh, as I said, from the EU, for example, Human Rights Watch raised a lot of attention on violations, on things that, uh, that happens in those countries. So there's a lot of international uh, civil society groups, uh, organizations who do raise awareness about the LGBT communities in the MENA and in the Arab world. Of course, this is where the, wherever they are allowed to enter and work because in some countries, 
they are banned or pro prohibited from uh, doing any type of work because of restrictions, and this is against uh, uh, the culture, against the tradition, against religion, etc. Finally, uh, as, as I said, while the EU support has been minimal in this area compared to areas such as security economy, uh, one can notice some activity on the ground, as I uh, mentioned in the previous uh, uh, slide. Local actors do act as veto players from the religious community, political elites, the family, the society. It's all working against uh, the acceptance or the uh, recognition of LGBT communities. Uh, one thing that we ha we hoped with the Arab uprising that things might change with respect to human rights, not necess not specifically only LGBT, but human rights in, gen in general, gender equality, uh, freedoms. But unfortunately, this faded away even in the country where it was considered to be the beacon for democracy. And unfortunately, despite the uh, backsliding in Tunisia, we don't hear anything, any criticism by the uh, Europeans regarding that. It's just silence. And this happened before the uh, unfortunate uh, war in uh, Ukraine. But uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of EU practices, we see, as I said earlier, there have been a lot of activities related to capacity building, promoting dialogue with governments, coordination among CSOs, uh, uh, providing money, uh, framing things within the broader context of human rights so that also when you apply for funding, when you apply for something, you're not hunted down because you are uh, applying for an LGBT code, because then you are basically uh, uh, trapped. Uh, as I said, this is not really a salient issue for the EU. It's a minor issue because other things have been more important for the EU, such as security, economy, uh, refugee crisis. Uh, so these are, you name it, there are many uh, problems uh, around the EU that are more important than promoting LGBT. But despite this, we see some progress and uh, it is important to understand why the situation is like this what LGBT people want in the region, and not only because it might be that what they are asking for, and this is what uh, in some of the interviews, uh, some of the interviewees told me, like, we're not calling for becoming accepted like same-sex marriage, like all these rights. No, we just wanted to be treated as a human beings. Simple. Is this too much to ask? And is this something that we cannot in the West support? And I think I will uh, stop here. Thank you. I, I tried to stick to the, to the time. <laughs> no problem. Um, OK, uh, so now on to the Q&A. Oh, okay. uh, does anyone have questions? I think there is some questions in the Q&A. Okay, I was wondering um, if you could maybe tell us a bit about how exactly on, on like an organizational level the EU engages like other like, kind of official working groups or committees that the EU has established in in regard to yeah and pushing these democratic ideas in the region, or is it more just like deciding on something and that's not yeah, mostly, mostly, as I said before, most of the fund or most of the activity happens through the delegations. So through the EU delegation, there's a call for funds, there are like roundtable talks, there are like uh, training sessions, uh, even education about like uh, medical issues, for example, uh, safe sex, et cetera, et cetera. All these are done at the, for example, by the EU delegation. There's also an, uh, the EU embassies do a lot of work. And here, like, uh, I have to, like, the Dutch embassy is very active. Uh, the German is as well. But the Dutch are, have been more active when it comes to LGBT before the other uh, countries. Another thing that uh, is the funding, the call for funds through the EU delegation. There are also schemes from member states through the embassies. Another th uh, thing that is, uh, we see also recently during the 
Day Against uh, Xenophobia, etc., you see the, the, all the European embassies raise the rainbow flag. And this is something that you see. As I said, it is changing slightly. It's not massive, but there have been uh, changes. And this is the main uh, way the EU can help. And I don't think, I don't believe that if the EU goes and say, yeah, we want to promote LGBT, that they will be welcome. No. And I think this is the best way that the EU can approach the situation because uh, you have a lot of veto players, starting from the elites, the traditional elites, who, who uh, some of them gain their uh, legitimacy from the religious elites. So they are not going to tell you, yeah, we promote, uh, we, we support LGBT, even if they are into, like, uh, in their hearts, they don't care or they don't mind, but they won't, won't say it publicly because it will harm them more than uh, help them. So you see this, uh, these type of activities, these practices that the EU does at the lower level is more important than just putting it in the document, uh, in the action plan or in the association agreements in which it's really vague language that is used and it doesn't really materialize when it comes to uh, promoting it or applying it on the ground. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. like, uh, uh, but, uh, so you said that uh, you were uh, comprehensive understanding when you compare the NPC uh, situation in the Western world and in the media, because uh, you said like we also. Uh, it's a long way evolving from a really deep focus in the community to a society that we all have. Um, yeah, so it took us a long way, right? Uh, and then you now mentioned what you can benefit from the community. So, yeah, as the news is still quite uh, quite not there, um, it, yeah, it's still very much a really focus society. Uh, so, do you think? Less religion is the only answer, or like actual actual change. Is there a second? No, I, I don't think less religion is the answer. Uh, I don't think so, but uh, because like you you do have like part of the society that is there and belong to these groups, and the the answer to this is to move closer to our democracy. Uh, and having this, because even in countries that have secular systems, but are based on sectarianism, like Lebanon, for example, as I said, it's, it is based on sectarianism, although like the country is supposed to be secular. But when it comes to LGBT rights, it's still problematic. So uh, things can change, but you cannot have a sharp change or switch like overnight that, yeah, we have to have this. And keep in mind, uh, people can be, some people say like we are religious, but we are also gay. We are religious, but we are lesbian, et cetera. Uh, and you will always have variations in the societies. As long as the problem is, as long as you don't have fully functioning democracies in those countries, you will always have this issue. And this is not the most important thing for people there. Because like now, even for the activists on the ground who cannot find a job or cannot, uh, find uh, food, who are basically uh, uh, oppressed, they move. And this is one of the also problems that you face that a lot of the uh, youth in those countries live abroad. And this is, pro this is an issue. And uh, when you ask people about the most salient issues in those countries, it's not uh, democracy. And unfortunately, it's not only not democracy, it's some, even when you ask them about, about democracy, it's about the basic things that we talk about in terms of good governance, anti-corruption, uh, uh, finding jobs, economic stability. So the basic uh, things that uh, for survival. And also like one of the problems that those societies have, if you cannot, uh, provide for the people and they are always rushing to find like ways to feed their, their children or to feed their families, how do you expect them to uh, develop in terms of their thinking? It doesn't happen. It's, it's, a, it's a circle. 
Yes. It's 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 all related. Like we, you because like when 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 I was doing the interviews and people were like, yeah, is this the most important thing that you're asking about? Like we can't even find the job, and then you're asking about about our opinion about this issue. So I, again, it's all these reforms, all these developments go hand in hand. And if we look at the uh, how like societies evolved over the years, it's they evolved in the thinking and the thoughts. They were basically didn't have to worry that I have food for today, but not for tomorrow. What should I do? So when you, when you have this situation in, in a lot of countries in the Middle East, how do you expect them to evolve? It's not going, it's not going to happen. And keep in mind, in many countries, religion, religion is something uh, like it's personal, it's uh, your connection to whatever you believe in. So it could be something, uh, for some people, it's something very good. For some people, they are anti-religion. But the problem in many countries, religion is not used as like something that connects you to your whatever you believe in, but it's used as a tool by the elites to oppress people. And if you go against, for example, the Ayatollah in Iran or the clergy uh, or the uh, sheikh in whatever country or the uh, mufti or so, basically you are a traitor. You can't. So again, the problem is when religion is used by the politicians as a tool to impose and to get legitimacy and impose their will on the people, and this is the way you have to live, then there's a, there's a huge problem and there's a lot that need to be done. And of course, the countries I mentioned are the easiest because if you go to like uh, other countries like Iran or Saudi Arabia, it's even more complicated. How do you educate uh, a population, mostly other people, about LGBTQ issues when the problem stems from culture learning from your parents' previous generations? I, I don't really know. This is like, this is something that, uh, to be honest, it's like, there is a generation gap. Like if you go to your parents, uh, not all parents, but like if you go to the grandparents, this is it, you can't even discuss this. So again, like uh, in societies that are mostly youth, and this is the situation in the Arab world, you can see some changes, but to change the mentality of people who've been living like 60, 70, 80 years, that this is something you don't even cross uh, the line, you don't even come close to it. I don't have any like answer to this. It's, it's sort of, I think it's easier to change other things than changing the mentality of the uh, elderly people. They are used to do these things in a way and they are not going to change it. Of course, uh, with education, with raising awareness about a lot of the misinformation yeah, like if you're a lot of the misinformation, like you're bringing diseases, you're doing this, you're doing that. When you raise awareness that this is not uh, promoting diseases, this is not a sickness, this is not a psychiatric uh, problem, this is not this and that. And when you raise awareness about this and educate people about it, you even if the change is small among the elderly, but you will see some changes. But a lot of the problems with, for example, gender equality, minority rights, uh, LGBT rights, is about education. And a lot of people still have these like uh, old ideas that, yeah, uh, you can create this disease or you can bring this disease and etc. But when you raise this awareness, when you show that this is not right, scientific evidence show this and this and that, you will see some change. And again, I'm not saying that we will see a change like uh, a huge uh, thing, but like things will uh, evolve. Uh, seeing that Lebanon is more lenient with LGBTQ communities, you can go and watch drag queens shows, for example. Do you think the fact that Lebanon is a democracy helped in this? Uh, honestly, I don't think the situation in Lebanon is that 
bright, unfortunately. Uh, and the, doing the, the main case I studied was Lebanon. We see that despite that there are some freedoms, but there are a lot of crackdown on LGBT communities. And many of the activists have been living abroad or are in jails, or they are basically working within the human rights uh, 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 slogan. Uh, it is better than others, but I don't think it is as uh, in the Western world. This is one thing. And the second thing, I don't believe Lebanon is really a democracy. We do have elections, but to what extent this is free and fair? To what extent I can go and criticize certain politicians or certain religious figures without being like uh, thrown into like uh, disappear or so? To what extent we live in, this, in, in a normal statehood? Because again, like you have different uh, groups in Lebanon, you have a militia in Lebanon uh, who's who, who has weapons, and I'm not sure that this helps in promoting a democratic system because it is jeopardized by uh, Hezbollah. And we cannot deny this fact. So even if you have uh, elections, even if you have some freedoms, if one of the political, um, one uh, military group doesn't accept something or doesn't agree with something, you cannot change it. And this is the reality. So unfortunately, I don't think uh, at the moment, Lebanon can be considered a democracy. Uh, yes. Maybe just because um, the, 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 the regards to this question, um, I, I also heard from a lot of like, different places, few Cubans, stuff that it can be a success in Lebanon. So why would you say that we have this image of it, you know, like the comments that like going to drag shows, for example. So if it's not about democracy, then why is all my these like marginal good things here? No, I'm, I'm not saying, like, if, if we understand democracy as freedoms, as, like, free, fair elections, the ability of the, the elected elites to rule on behalf of the people without being subjected to another authority that imp imposes its opinion on it, then Lebanon doesn't fit there because you have Hezbollah. And Hezbollah imposes its will on Lebanon, and they take their orders from Iran, and everyone knows that. There are some issues, some like freedoms that dates back to the, uh, to the like uh, 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, even after the civil war. But can we consider Lebanon as a real democracy? Not really. Because if you have any, uh, anything against certain groups, you cannot really say it. There are, of course, uh, there are some freedoms, of course, you can say a few things, so you can do, it's much better than the rest of the Arab world. So if you want to look at Lebanon in relative terms, it's much better than the rest of the world, the Arab world. But if you compare like uh, Lebanon against the main criteria of democracy, then we fail on money, unfortunately. Of course, there are certain freedoms. There are certain, uh, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, etc. It does exist, but to a certain limit. And things also since 2019, the, 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 you can't even talk about a country. It, has, it is a failed state on all different levels, with the economic crisis, with the, uh, with the port blast, uh, involvement in the Syrian war before that, uh, basically, the country, the, the entire institutions are not functioning properly. So we can't even talk about a fully functioning state anymore. Add to this that Lebanon suffers from areas of limited statehood, and this has been since 1948 with the uh, refugees from Palestine, and then with the uh, Syrian refugees, and then you have Hezbollah. So you have many issues, many problems. Again, I repeat, if it is in relative terms, you have way more freedoms than the neighbors. But when it comes to like comparing it to what is democracy really, then we have uh, Lebanon do suffer from issues with respect to democracy. Does it answer your question? Yeah, I think I was more wondering because you also said it's relatively better, but then the question is like, why? <laughs> why is it there relatively better? Keep in mind, like Lebanon has always been like uh, closer to France. 
It was under the French mandate. It's a mixed country. So there are Muslims, there are Christians, there are, you have 17, 18 sects in the country. So you cannot really impose one uh, system on everyone. Like you, uh, you have to be like an Islamic state or like a, a Christian, no. So it's a mix of many. And this diversity for a while strengthened the, uh, the cultural diversity in the country and also the inclusiveness and acceptance of, uh, of everyone. And since it's a small country, it always had good relations with the West and especially specifically with France. And uh, that was also reflected when the blast happened. The first uh, president who came and checked, the, went to Lebanon was the French president. So this does this close ties to the uh, to the Western world, especially to the French, uh, to the to France, does did have an impact on the uh, country. And for the for a long time before the civil war, it used to be sort of the Paris of the Middle East, like everyone who wanted to have fun, who went in the Arab world and had the money, because it, in their countries they weren't allowed to do many of uh, the funds, like uh, having fun or going to pubs, etc. They used to come to Lebanon. And then the war happened, and then after the civil war, things changed uh, to the better. But then after that, with the, uh, with, the, with the assassination of the prime minister Hariri, and then all the following assassinations, and then uh, taking the country closer to the Iranian side, and involving in the Syrian war, and having all the Syrian, a lot of Syrian refugees in the country did also uh, result in the collapse of the state itself. And also like it's uh, now like uh, it is struggling. So you can't really talk about a, a state anymore, unfortunately. But this diversity that was, that was in Lebanon and is led to being different than the rest of the uh, Arab world. Uh, I think there's one more question online. I'm not sure if on it when they talk about the country. I, I think religion does have a role in acceptance or rejection of LGBT. We can't deny this fact. Uh, Islamic scholars, uh, religious people, this is a sin. You can't, you can't rush, you cannot discuss this with them. And uh, to give an example, like uh, when uh, LG, some LGBT groups try to do a like sort of a, a lecture or something in at the American University of Beirut, uh, the official uh, orga religious organization like Dar al Fatah didn't say anything. They were quiet. But there's another group of scholars who basically threatened that they will destroy the event. And then the event didn't happen. So religious groups do have a strong say in uh, acceptance or rejection of LGBT communities. But despite all of this, we see that LGBT communities are still trying to push forward with respect to being accepted into society. And as I said, also societies do evolve. And what we, what we used not to see before, uh, a decade or two decades ago, now you can see it on the streets. Like before, uh, when, I, when, I visit, when I used to visit Lebanon, uh, while I was studying abroad, uh, you you never saw, or even when I was a, a kid, you never saw like, uh, for example, men holding hands or like uh, yeah, someone dressed in a different way. Uh, it's always like yeah, people used to, if you, you didn't even try to expose yourself. But now, no, the situation is different. Even on the TV, on the talk shows, it was never the case, but now you see it. So despite that the religious communities act as veto points, but to a certain extent, because at the end of the day, you cannot impose your agenda, your will, your understanding, your ideas on others. You can do it for a short, for a such a, for a, some time, but you cannot do it all the time. People will rebel against you. And if you keep cracking on them, they will become more powerful and more accepted. And again, as I said, this takes, takes time. And when we go back to the same thing and this circle, if you do not provide for the people and they are rushing to get just to make uh, 
uh, a living, they can't even fight for their rights anymore. Because like now when you look at the situation in Lebanon, for example, the situation is really horrible. And then you always ask like, why people are not even protesting against these corrupt elites who basically stole the money of the people, uh, bankrupt the banks. Uh, the central bank barely has any reserve left to basically to pay for things. And still people are not even protesting after uh, 2019, nothing. And then when you talk to people asking them like, why nothing is happening, like the, the exchange rate, like the depreciation of the currency is massive. Like what you, you used to make, for example, $2,000, now it is equivalent to $100. And people are silent. And then they tell you, we, we can't even think about anything, just like, what is the price of oil? What is the price of bread? Can we afford to buy it? So in such an environment, it becomes impossible to think about any other thing. And this is the problem that at least Lebanon suffers from and also, but the rest of the world, the rest of the Arab world has different also problems that they do struggle with. Any other questions? I think we can conclude that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the people who joined online. Uh, but this concludes our lecture for today. Thank you, Dr. Atem. And thank you for everyone who joined us. And I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture and got to know a bit more the Middle East and the relationships between the EU and the Arab world in the context of LGBTQI activism. Thank you so much.